The story of the tragic life of a painter is something heard so often that it almost becomes a concept engraved in the very art form. Whilst many have seen this as a sort of romantic Shakespearean tragedy that is irresistible to muddy up with myths and embellishments, I have personally always seen this as a genuine curse of having such creative genius. Whenever I hear of young talents in the media, young as in barely 18, being expected to travel constantly, work constantly, meet expectations constantly and so on, I can't help but feel genuinely concerned for the mental well-being of such people in the long run. Not to say anything bad will happen to all of them, in fact I assume and hope they're being very well looked after, but if the arts have taught us any hard truths, is that often young artists have been unfairly exploited, overworked, or misunderstood. And the saddest thing about it is that often creative people are also some of the most sensitive and most self-destructive people. And although, again, the story has been told many times, there is something particularly poignant to me, as well as being a perfect example of fame exploiting creatives. Regarding the story of a groundbreaking American neo-artist, Jean-Michel Basquiat. The man who produced these mysterious paintings, consisting of scratches and scribbles of colour, strange diagrams, various words, letters and numbers meticulously placed in a constellation of imagery, would be unlike anything the art world had yet seen. And most importantly, they would unveil a huge social flaw that up until his time was not yet discussed or resolved in the art world as well. In a community that seemingly still clung on to the influence of Caucasian European history and law, by the 1980s, Jean-Michel would in the most creative ways possible implement his roots into his work, in an admirable effort to at last allow black culture to become part of art history. Although his legacy now has been globally influential, possibly more than Jean-Michel would ever have imagined, his life before his eventual untimely death, aged just 27, would be nothing short of heartbreaking. Although he obtained all the fame and money that he could have ever dreamed of, it would still not be enough to achieve the one thing that he wanted above all else, which was for people to accept him. Although his fascinating career was sadly brief, his whole story shines an invaluable light on how sensationalism can truly exploit the vulnerable and how irrefutably difficult it would be for a young talent in the 1980s to prove his significance and overturn misconceptions of him simply based on his background and the colour of his skin. Today we explore the now what could be called revolutionary artwork of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Welcome everyone, before we get started I just wanted to quickly thank and introduce you to an exciting offer from today's video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. What I personally love about watching and making YouTube videos is knowing that the content is readily available for anyone around the world to experience, which is why in stark contrast it's a little more than frustrating that you can't watch a particular show or movie on Netflix for example, simply because it's not available in your country. Well that's where Surfshark VPN comes in. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to easily change your virtual location to a country of your choosing. Most importantly though, Surfshark allows you to enjoy your online entertainment or online anything really as safely and as securely as possible, allowing you to encrypt your online information, keeping your passwords, videos and photos safe and secure. It allows you to do this on multiple devices from just one account as well. But the best part is, thanks to the offer that they've given to me to you today, is that you not only get 83% off, but you also get an extra 3 months free as well. Simply click on the link in the description below and enter the promo code DWELLER to take full advantage of their essential tools to watch online entertainment safely. And with a 30 day money back guarantee included, there's virtually no risk in at least trying it out. Thank you again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and without further ado, enjoy the video. Basquiat was born in 1960, on December 22nd, in Brooklyn, New York, to father Jared Basquiat, who had immigrated from Haiti, and Brooklyn-born mother Matilda Basquiat, who was of Puerto Rican descent. Jean-Michel was the second of four children. He had two sisters and originally an older brother, but who sadly would pass away shortly after Jean-Michel's birth. 
As the boy grew older, his sisters, Lisa and Basquiat, and Janine Herivo, would recount Jean-Michel being very energetic, curious, and at times even mischievous. To name one example, during a block party, him and his sisters would be watching their mother cutting watermelon, leading the cheeky young artist to be, to turn to his sisters, trying to encourage them to eat the watermelon seeds so that later they could, quote, sweat watermelon juice, and all you had to do was stick your tongue out and drink watermelon juice all the time. It goes to little surprise that even at his age, his wild imagination was already beginning to erupt from him. It would not be until his mother, who had happened to be fond of the arts, would take her son to visit the many local museums and galleries that the big city had to offer, and Basquiat would truly begin to become enamoured by the world of art. His mother would happily motivate her son to continue exploring his interest in art by encouraging him to draw the cartoons that he would watch on the TV. By the time he was six years old, he was already being privately educated at the arts-oriented St. Anne's School in Brooklyn Heights. It would seem he was practically destined from the start to be involved in art in some form or another. But even at this time, we would see our first early glimpses of what would truly define his style later on in his career. But sadly, it would come in a very traumatic way. In 1968, barely a year after enrolling into St. Anne's, young Basquiat would suddenly be hit by a car whilst he was playing on the street, resulting in a broken arm and several internal injuries that would result in a splenectomy. He was barely seven years old at the time. With the discomfort of pain, fear, and loneliness, his mother would visit and comfort her son, providing him with a copy of Grey's Anatomy to keep him entertained. Not only did it keep him occupied though, but it completely immersed him into a lifelong fascination with themes related to human anatomy, medicine, or hospitals, which would frequently appear in many of his later masterpieces. As if a harrowing incident of a car accident would not be enough to deeply wound Jean-Michel, the same year, he would later discover his parents were arranging to divorce. Unlike the relationship to his mother Matilda, his father's expectations of his children were somewhat more complicated, especially for Jean-Michel. Gerard was not so keen on the arts, as his wife and son were, and essentially believed the only key to success, especially for a black man living in America, is simply to conform to the already established white American system, because an important business executive, a lawyer, accountant, attorney, and so on, would be seen more worthy or acceptable. A scenario that simply would not do for young Jean-Michel, with a head full of far bigger dreams, but regardless, he and his sisters would remain under the care of their father, following his divorce to Matilda. She would be distraught from the end of a marriage, suffering from a nervous breakdown that would tragically lead to her to be committed to various psychiatric institutions for the rest of her life following this event. As Basquiat reached his teen years, still broken and confused from the dramatic weight of his parents' divorce and the effects that it had on his mother, he became increasingly rebellious, especially towards his strict and sometimes even violent father. And sure enough, outside of his broken family life, he would encounter other like-minded individuals who shared his desire to unburden their inner pain with some kind of expressive outlet. One such person would be his childhood friend Al Diaz, whom he would eventually partner up with to begin Basquiat's first step into art with their street art alias of Samo, a name originally used as a tongue-in-cheek abbreviation of a phrase, same old sh**. The pair would begin spray painting in the lower Manhattan areas, displaying something practically unheard of within graffiti at this time in history, where typically a graffiti artist would simply tag his or her name or pseudonym in a kind of hey look at me sort of fashion. Basquiat and Diaz were instead displaying insightful and satirical poetry and phrases, leaving a copyright symbol at the end of their alias. By now, although the vision in young Jean-Michel's head of him being famous or at least respected was glowing brightly, he did not see Samo as the sole solution to fortune, perhaps merely the first of many stepping stones to his goal. But already, attention and buzz would steadily pick up and circulate around the many appearances of Samo on street walls. However, yet again, the expectations of his father, as well as his truancy and misbehaviour at school, would continue to be great obstacles. 
when eventually, in 1978, his father learned that 17-year-old Jean-Michel had dropped out of school entirely. That was that. The teenager would leave the household for good, living rough for a good long while, occasionally working in a warehouse and continuing to work on his graffiti at night. Things seemingly couldn't have looked more bleak for the young artist, now living homeless in arguably one of the most hostile cities in America. It would be nothing short of a miracle for this recent school dropout to even come close to fame and success. But little did he know in the background, the media buzz and fascination in his spray painting endeavours were continuing to spread like wildfire. As newspaper articles on the mysterious and increasingly popular duo Samo began to mount up, it would not be long until The Village Voice, an alternative news weekly centred around the arts, music and culture of the city, would begin to take notice. However, as the success of Samo had picked up pace, the duo was steadily drifting apart. Due to the artistic differences, as well as differing on ambitions, the two graffiti artists decided to walk away from each other. Basquiat would in fact mark this parting of ways with the message, Samo is dead, which would later become iconic to the closely watching graffiti art fans, with the message appearing on the facade of many local galleries and downtown buildings during 1980. Although this was the end of a partnership, Basquiat was continuing to further experiment with different mediums and create different ways to sell his art. Now jobless and still very much homeless and penniless, he would primarily support himself through peddling and hand-painted merchandise, such as postcards and t-shirts, which although would later be regarded as priceless collectibles, it would still not quite be enough to ensure a meal or a place to stay, often resorting to panhandling, dealing drugs, or according to him, looking for money on the floor of certain nightclubs just to get by. But as he immersed himself further into downtown city life, opportunities to truly display his art, or at least draw wider attention to him, were continuing to show up for him. Not only was his street art beginning to appear on public access TV networks, taking every opportunity to be interviewed, despite his general shy demeanour, but he would also dip his toes into the music scene. He would perform as a DJ in many clubs, establishing himself as part of a new wave music scene suddenly taking over the city, especially in the Lower East Side. This is how he would eventually form a band with his friend and a filmmaker, Michael Holman, who had previously helped Jean-Michel feature on public access TV parties. The band would later be known as Grey, curiously yet unsurprisingly, inspired by the book Basquiat received when he was bedridden in hospital, Grey's Anatomy. The whole concept would be outside the realms of a norm since the night that they formed the band, as neither were trained musicians in their own right, but the music would be achieved through their methods of chopping and deconstructing sounds to create abstract, audible art on various types of synthesizers, sound boxes, and even classical instruments, with Basquiat caught in a photo, apparently giving it his all on a clarinet. The two would eventually hire more members to join the band, and they would perform in clubs such as CBGB's, Mud Club, and Max's Kansas City. Michael Holman would himself describe the music as, quote, ignorant music, continuing on to say that, Our attitude was like, let's embrace the idea that we don't know how to play our instruments, and let's only have people in the band who don't know how to play instruments. Let's approach the instruments in a new way. Let's play them as if we're aliens from another world and we have no idea how the instrument was meant to be played. But we knew beautiful music and sound when we heard it. It would seem even before his artistry had fully manifested, Jean-Michel was only interested in trying a hand in things that were new or attempted to be different. Basquiat was desperate for something yet unseen within the world of expression. Yet during this turn of the decade, Basquiat's inner frustrations and feelings of oppression were once again pushing him into another fresh start. Feeling critical of a lack of people of colour in the downtown scene, he began spending more time with graffiti artists in the more uptown places such as the Bronx and Harlem. By the early 1980s, his street art was subsequently appearing on the streets less and less, as now more gallery showings of his pieces were popping up everywhere. Encouraged by various friends within the art scene, including collectors and curators, Basquiat would start purchasing more professional art supplies. 
Although still very poor, he would by now have a very steady relationship with the former bartender and waitress, Susan Malloch, who also allowed the young artist to move in with her, providing not only a roof over his head, but a place to work on his paintings, which initially would not be on paper or canvas, but rather on old doors, windows, refrigerators, or really anything that Jean-Michel could find on the streets in order to save money. His most noteworthy early exhibition would be at the Multi-Artist Show at the New Times Square in the year 1980, where he would begin to pick up the attention and interest from reputable art critics, with one article naming him as, quote, the Radiant Child, further concreting his reputation as a truly unique, young, up-and-coming artist. Even his first solo exhibition would not be long afterwards, as in 1982, his work was displayed in the Anina Nose Gallery in Soho. Around the same period, Basquiat had taken his art to an incredibly sophisticated level, even for his young age, by representing the human figure in what could be argued as more contemporary ways, or certainly in a way that fit the alternative scene of downtown New York that everyone now wanted a piece of. The early work of Basquiat would feature alongside other artists such as David Sal and Julian Schnabel, who would collectively popularise the exciting new art movement, later to be referred to as Neo-Expressionism. Jean-Michel, however, had a particularly specific mission planned for him and his work. A lot of the imagery Basquiat was experimenting with during this time was heavily influenced by his personal and cultural background such as the African diaspora, and of course his fascination in anatomical themes. For example, one of his most well-known masterpieces on canvas, as well as one of his earliest, would be the untitled painting that would eventually coin the unofficial title of The Skull, produced in 1981. This intricate display of scratches and patches takes on a very similar appearance and feel to that of Frankenstein's monster, with multiple coloured patches of skin and crude stitching. The background itself is thought to be significant to Basquiat's life and surroundings, as they're believed to be aspects of the New York City subway system. The colours used are also significant, giving off the appearance of bruised or damaged flesh, made all the more tangible by the expression of a face, with eyes downcast and staring beyond despondently. There is almost a violent energy that radiates from his piece, as if it's displaying the aftermath of a fight. It would be the following year of 1982 that his work would truly begin to make a global impact on the art scene, however, with more of his trademark skulls and multi-patterned faces beginning to appear in solo exhibitions. By this year, he was beginning to paint on canvas more regularly, and releasing his work at as many as six solo exhibitions around the world. For example, in Kassel in Germany, Jean-Michel would be the youngest artist in history to be part of the international contemporary art extravaganza known as Documenta. He would continue on to create as many as over 200 paintings during this period, seemingly creating art of any kind, at any time, in any place. This would also be the year in which an equally significant alliance would form between Jean-Michel and one of the most widely respected artists in the world. Contrary to popular belief, Basquiat would not meet Andy Warhol by sheepishly approaching the established pop artist with one of his bright and colourful postcards whilst Warhol was having lunch at a local restaurant. In fact, gallery artist and collector Bruno Bischofberger would later claim to have formally introduced the two artists to each other when he invited them to lunch late that year. Regardless of how the two would cross paths, this relationship between the young and exciting prospect and one of the greatest figureheads in the art scene would later prove to be life-changing for both of them. Outside of the art studio, Basquiat was still a regular face in the New York clubbing scene, able to make connections with virtually anybody, including Debbie Harry from the band Blondie, who would purchase one of his paintings for $200, considered to be a fortune to the then still modestly living artist. Jean-Michel may have now entered the art scene, stirred excitement, and even provided something new and unexpected, but something was still not right. Something unfixed and unchallenged lingered in the gallery rooms that Basquiat was desperate to express himself. To put it frankly, Basquiat felt no less alone, misunderstood, or insignificant in spite of his talent and success. 
simply because he was a black man now trying to prove himself to an incredibly whitewashed industry, for lack of a better way of putting it. Up until this time, the art world was founded solely on white artists, displaying white figures inspired by white culture, and Jean-Michel, quite rightfully, felt alienated by it. Barely, if not at all, did African-inspired culture exist within the art world, even within the supposedly progressive modern art world of that period. Even though Jean-Michel was influenced by a wide range of Caucasian history, literature and artists, it was absolutely imperative to him that black culture would become more normalised and celebrated within the art form. He would begin incorporating a lot of his African and African-American heroes in his paintings, such as African royalty and jazz and bebop musicians. Jean-Michel would also become incredibly protective of his work as his popularity continued to rise. By the time he had his own studio loft and had collectors knocking on his door nearly every day, demanding art from him, yet simultaneously asking for specific colours or imagery to match their furniture for example, Basquiat had very little patience for such conversations, often resulting in him slamming a door on a lot of collectors' faces. Even if it potentially meant losing a cheque for thousands of dollars, he would not let anything hinder or corrupt his honesty in his craft. However, by the mid-1980s, whomever Jean-Michel would turn away would make very little difference. Basquiat was making as much as over a million dollars a year from the sales of his artwork. Sometimes his entire collection would sell out in a single night. And the newfound friendship between him and Andy Warhol, in his eyes, was seen as a precious golden key to truly leave his mark in the more elite and glamorous side of the art industry. An achievement that Basquiat was adamant to grasp, it would lead to them collaborating with each other from 1984 to 1986, such as 10 Punching Bags, Last Supper, produced between 1985 and 1986. Warhol would typically start the painting, creating an image distinctive to his style, with Basquiat later defacing and altering the painting to make it an intricate hybrid of pop art and neo-expressionism. Although some would be impressed with the results of one of the greatest working with one of the youngest and most promising, the vast majority of critics would unfortunately disagree, seeing the results as merely a desperate and out of touch attempt to commercialise a new trend and restore relevancy to a former star in art, but nonetheless was nowhere near his previous level of influence. To downtown New York, Basquiat was practically the king and hero of the underground scene, but as Jean-Michel wanted to push himself further into the realms of the greats, in bigger galleries and bigger museums, more of his work would be rejected, shrugged off by old-fashioned minded art critics and creators as overly simple or too primitive to match pre-existing masterpieces in the galleries Jean-Michel dreamed of. Even when collaborating with a household name like Andy Warhol, the confused or underwhelmed reactions from the artistic elite would remain the same seeing this kid from the streets as just a graffiti artist who just got lucky. The term of graffiti artist would be one that Basquiat would absolutely resent. And so, and you're, you're seen as, as some sort of uh, primal expressionism, is that, I mean... Like an ape? Well, uh, let, let's... A, a primate? Well, well, I don't know, is that... Is that you the, said it, I don't know, you, you said it. While it may be true in some of Basquiat's work that at face value, some examples may appear at first glance to be very minimal, or almost resembling the drawing of a toddler. But make no mistake, this style was absolutely intentional from day one, and Jean-Michel would never take to the canvas with blind eyes and a head empty of ideas. He would claim in many interviews and arguments with his now increasing number of critics that each scratch and each smudge of paint would have a significant meaning and purpose. Even the words scribbled out in his painting, such as Roosevelt III, produced in 1983, displaying words painted on and then crossed out or painted over again in numerous places. The reason being, Basquiat would explain, is that when a word is more obscured, the more likely an observer will be drawn to it, an almost reverse psychology experiment that he would love to include within some of his paintings. Following the rather cold criticism of Warhol and Basquiat's calibration project, the relationship between the two would naturally also begin to sour. 
already close friends of Jean-Michel were beginning to see an unfavourable change within him. He began disassociating himself from his downtown past, attending more parties reserved for the super rich, and becoming increasingly obsessed with the idea of being accepted by certain crowds. Andy Warhol was seen as no less innocent in the picture, with some claiming he was straight up exploiting Jean-Michel for gaining influence of younger crowds, and many even stating due to Warhol's sexuality that he was trying to seduce the young artist. This, unfortunately, would not be the most significant change in Basquiat that his friends would begin to see. Although a friend had recounted Basquiat's use of heroin as early as 1980, by the mid-80s, it was sadly plain as day that his addiction was now spiralling. He would become increasingly paranoid, blotches would start appearing on his face, and his once previously busy morning schedules of hours and hours of painting were beginning to fizzle out. Although now he was making more money than he could have possibly imagined, still young and used to poverty, he would struggle to handle such bountiful income, often spending the money on drugs. As well as heroin, his addiction to cocaine became so problematic that he would disfigure the inside of his nose by damaging his nasal septum. He would also tire of New York and begin branching out to new studios to start fresh work, such as Los Angeles, that would prompt many video recordings of him experimenting whilst watching TV and listening to beat pop on a stereo, which by now was his traditional method of working and gaining inspiration. However, even though his painting rituals would remain the same in a new environment, his style of art was quite noticeably changing. A slightly more minimal aesthetic was beginning to shine through, often a very typical trait of artists who continued to paint during their autumn years, despite how young Basquiat still was at the time. By 1987, following his return to New York, at the end of a romantic relationship, Basquiat was slipping further into obscurity, becoming a recluse and continuing to swerve further away from attempts of sobriety. Some close to him would claim following the death of Andy Warhol that year, Jean-Michel was particularly heartbroken, and all the more socially evasive. Even when trying to rebuild a relationship with his father, showing off his wealth and success to him for his approval, he would only be rejected once again, pushing Jean-Michel further into that pit of him not feeling that he belonged anywhere. The following year would sadly be the last year of Jean-Michel's life, completing the painting not long prior to his death, with an eerily foreboding title, Riding with Death produced in 1988. By this time, Basquiat had tired of his work being described by the ignorant crowd as either primitive or naive, and so a lot of his later paintings would fully play along sarcastically to the stereotype, displaying his art like it were a cave painting or a tribal painting. There is always something haunting about the final painting of an artist, especially when the whole theme and look and even the name of that painting almost resonates with the inevitable that is to come. It's almost as if Jean-Michel anticipated his own death being merely around the corner. And sadly, in August of that year, Jean-Michel Basquiat would die at the age of 27 from a heroin overdose at his home on Great Jones Street in Manhattan. When he arrived at the medical center in New York, he was pronounced dead on arrival. The career and life of Basquiat may have been terribly short, but if I could name one of the most satisfying outcomes from all of this is that whether he lived to see it or not, he completely proved his critics wrong. The cultural impact of his art since his death has concreted his status as one of the founding pioneers of neo-expressionism, arguably more so than the then more respected Caucasian artists of the genre at the time. Because what Basquiat brought to the art world was the exposure of corruption and lack of diversity within its own industry. No such art existed for where Basquiat and his family came from. No real desire or motivation to make Western art more diverse, multicultural and refreshing would come to be until Basquiat decided that fateful day, at the age of 17, to run away from the norms and expectations and do something completely game-changing. His rags to riches story has inspired so many to recreate his life in forms of documentaries and even movies. New generations of artists still to this day pay homage to the black kid from Brooklyn who wasn't afraid to say art needed something new and something that respected his culture. The kid who even before reaching the age of 20 had the purest of talent to redefine the way that we look at art forever. Rule books that were previously there were now made redundant thanks to artists like Basquiat. 
but much like my recent video on Kurt Cobain and many other young artists who died far too young, it came at a huge price. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but I can't help but feel sometimes that we're just going to repeat history by continuing to squeeze every last drop out of young talents hardly in their 20s yet. Every human being has a limit to what public and media pressures they can take. Basquiat only wanted acceptance of his background and heritage, not to be constantly seen by the media as a scruffy graffiti artist from a broken home and a life of poverty. He wanted fame and attention, as most of his closest friends would admit, but he wanted above all else for his work to be respected, like that of his heroes, to be on the wall alongside the likes of Picasso, who we adored as a child. But a constant lack of understanding, or at least a lack of desire to understand his work by the media, would only prove more and more painful, and the demand for masterpieces more stressful. These kind of expectations, instead of embracing or accepting a healthy need for change, can not only be counterproductive, but also discouraging for artists to truly show their unique outlook on the world. And although it would eventually prove to be too much pressure to take by the time he reached 27 years old, regardless of how many more snobbish crowds disregarded his art as just crude scribbles, I can't help but admire that, till the very end, he stayed true to his vision and genius, producing countless works that were not only relevant to political, economic and racial issues in the 1980s, but remain equally as inspirational and thought-provoking to the modern-day viewer as well, with his paintings still selling at auction for hundreds of millions of dollars to this day, all the more proving just how precious his style of artwork really was, and still is. Thank you so much for watching, I hope this has been of interest, and I sincerely hope you found something valuable and inspiring in the artwork of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Before I go, it's that time again for Artist Corner, where I get to share some artwork sent in by one of my viewers. And today, I'm excited to introduce you to the hauntingly beautiful artwork of Demaya Charco. She's been painting since she was 13, and drawing since she could hold a pencil in her hand. Normally, she's drawn to the more beautiful and conventional concepts in art, until one day she realised that she could use art as therapy instead of trying to impress others with her technical skill in her work. She says she really found herself as an artist after being driven to paint images that she was afraid of, and images that would portray the darker sides of herself, but in a beautiful way, conveying strong, uncomfortable emotions that can't be fathomed into imagery that you see here now. Amazingly, she's also mostly self-taught, apart from a few learned mediums in high school. She says her art is also very influenced from Kurt Cobain's style of creativity and his use of colours. And I truly see that homage shine through in her work. I love her very similar style of creating figures in her surreal paintings, who bear the same slender, husk-like features as if they're a mummified corpse or in some way, in my eyes at least, a perfect representation of how it feels to be objectified. I had a look on her Instagram, and I love the piece that she named on there, taking the dog for a walk. Not just because of a weirdness of essential figures, but even her style of creating the background looks so dreamlike and ethereal. Please go and show us some much deserved love on her Instagram that you see here and in the description below. If you're an artist and want to feature on my channel, please send your artwork and a bit about yourself to blindweller at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter, by the way, if you want to have a chat with me on there. And a huge thanks to all of my top tier channel members for this month. Christopher Watts, Port Perea, Classy Chassis, Wendy Go, Ken B, Carol Hartung, and Garrett Greathouse. If you'd like a shout out in a future video, or want to see my content early, please consider becoming a Blind Dweller member today, for as little as $2.99 a month. Thank you again for watching, see you in the next one soon, and bye for now.